uh, some of our opening remarks. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the second session of our spring 2022 virtual author presentations. A quick note for those of you who were not able to attend our first session in April with Grace Olmsted, the recording for that is available on our website. My name is Amelia Velasic, and I am the Partnerships and Programs Supervisor for the Idaho Commission for Libraries. And I will also be your host today. I wanted to take a few minutes at the top of our hour together to go over some housekeeping items, provide a little bit of background about the program, and introduce today's speaker. First, a few quick housekeeping items. If you have any technical issues during today's session, please use the chat feature to send us a message. Annie Gaines is with us today as our behind the scenes technical expert, and she can help you with any technical issues. If you have questions that you would like us to ask the author during today's question and answer session, please use the Q&A feature to submit those, as this will make sure we don't miss anyone's questions. And you can submit questions through the Q&A feature at any time during the author's presentation. And finally, please be sure to complete our session feedback form before leaving today. We'll post a link to that in the chat. And Josie, you can go ahead and post a link to that feedback form at any time, and that way people can grab it throughout the presentation as they uh, see fit. So if all goes according to plan, here's how today's session will proceed. Our distinguished guest will present for about 30 minutes, and this will be followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. And finally, I'll wrap up our time together with some closing remarks and information about our next session in the series. And now for a little bit of background information on the program before I introduce today's author. This virtual Encore series is being presented in partnership between the Idaho Commission for Libraries and the Idaho Humanities Council. For over 30 years, these two organizations have partnered to bring book discussion programs to libraries statewide. The Let's Talk About It program brings together humanities scholars and adult readers in public libraries to read and discuss literature, which explores American values, history, and culture. This year, in addition to the programs hosted locally at public libraries, we've added this state virtual series to our repertoire. We're excited to connect with the authors from three of our newest program titles as they share their insights and experiences and provide us with new depth and understanding about their books. Today's presenter is Tiffany Midge, author of Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese's. Part memoir, part social commentary, this collection of essays, stories, and open letters dismantles traditional writing forms while poking fun at the mainstream cultural landscape. Midge pulls none of her punches as she examines the realities of indigenous life, juxtaposing biting humor with hard realities. Not for the faint of heart, her sharp wit will make readers squirm and laugh in equal measure. Midge's book is featured in our newest Let's Talk About It theme called Form and Fluidity, Writing in the New Millennium. This theme focuses on the unique perspectives, styles, and formats of writing that have emerged in the new millennium. The books in this theme push beyond the boundaries of traditional writing, experimenting with form, tone, text, perspective, and identity. The theme presents literature as a renewable, evolving resource, one that will always grow and change to reflect the cultural moment in which it is created. In addition to the book featured in our program, Ms. Midge is the author of three collections of poetry and a regular columnist for High Country News and the Moscow Pullman Daily. She's the recipient of a number of distinguished awards, which I won't list here, but if you'd like to know what they are, you are certainly welcome to see them on our website. And her work has been featured in a variety of publications, including World Literature Today, McSweeney's, and Massachusetts Review. Midge is a citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation and was raised by wolves in the Pacific Northwest. Her non-literary hobbies include composting, ski walks through dewy meadows, and an aspiration to be the first distinguished writer in residence at the Seattle Space Needle. Tiffany, we are so excited to have you here with us today. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to thank the Idaho Commission for Libraries for having me here today. Um, thank you for the guests for joining me. 
And um, to Amelia, thank you very much for your thoughtful planning and all of your engagement. Um, part of this uh, series, uh, the series um, thesis today is uh, form and fluidity. Uh, and that was um, a brainchild of Paula Coomer. And I'm going to be responding to the essay or the sort of guiding um, theme of, of today's talk. And that was um, very thoughtfully written um, and created by Paula Coomer. So thanks to her as well. Um, so thanks so much for the introduction. <laughs> Um, I always kind of laugh when I hear um, that I was raised by wolves um, in Washington State. Um, even though I wrote it, I still laugh at that. I don't know why. It's not even that good of a joke. Um, <laughs> uh, for my presentation today, I wanted to respond um, to Paula Coomer's essay or um, her theme um, description, um, Form and Fluidity. And I wanted to uh, discuss some ways that my own writing reflects and is informed by the ideas in her essay. And I'll be sharing some of my own work um, as it relates to some of, um, some of the themes that she brought up. So I'm just gonna read a, um, a section of that um, in case you haven't already. And this is from Paula. And she writes, in the latter decades of the 20th century, the word postmodern was coined as a critical label attached to a group of fiction writers in the US who were challenging established literary conventions. The postmodernist view rejected assumptions about plot and characterization, for example, or toyed with the point of view, calling into question not only accepted literary practices, but the capacity of language to represent reality in any trustworthy way. As postmodernism expanded itself to define what some argue is a cultural era and which others refer to as post postmodernism, novels, memoirs, and poetry became increasingly eccentric, inclined towards fractured traditions and combined forms known as hybrids. Now, I'm not a stranger um, to the post-postmodernism, and my work is not a stranger to the idea of combined forms um, such as hybrids and fractured um, forms and, and things like that. Um, and I've talked a lot about interchangeability um, in my own work, um, how a certain piece that I've written, I might also consider um, to be many things, flash nonfiction, uh, memoir, a poem. And because quite often I write prose poetry that is a uh, hybrid poetry, which is like sort of a combination of all of these things. Um, Oftentimes I can, uh, they appear to be an essay um, and often a humor or satire piece. Um, I would say that a lot of my work, particularly in Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese's um, is humor or satire. Um, and a lot of that work falls into that category. And recently I decided to rename them because so often we don't have a name for what a humor piece is. We call it a humor piece or a satire piece. Um, and we, a piece just doesn't seem to really cut it. So I renamed them combining sassy with essay. Um, and then that combined is sassy. I thought it was, I thought it was useful. <laughs> it needed to be done. Um, so because quite often that I write prose poetry um, or what is what can one can consider prose poetry that is hybrid poetry, um, which often appears to be an essay or more often a humor or satire piece, I've taken a lot of liberties with form um, or rather taken a poetic license with form. I actually was motivated um, to do this and given permission, so to speak, from uh, Claudia Rankine's um, book of poems called Citizen, an American Lyric. Rankine's book was a finalist for the National Book Award in Poetry and a winner for the National Books Critics Circle Award in Poetry. But insofar as what is considered traditional poetic verse, 
her book defies all of those conventions. Poetry and prose has been around for a long while, but this book by all counts looks like a book of essays and photo essays. So this compelled me to compile a collection of my humor op-eds, um, my sassays, <laughs> and humor essays and other pieces of more experimental forms, um, such as a poem. I call it a poem at this point, but it is also, you know, a sassay or an essay or a flash. Um, a poem that I titled, um, Thirst, or it was titled First World Story Problems, Brown Girl Multiple Choice Edition. And then what I did is I sent this out to poetry book contests, um, the collection that I had put together, which I actually called, yeah, I called it First World Story Problems. Um, and the thing was, is did it look like a collection of conventionally standard poetry? No, <laughs> no, it didn't. Uh, was it even within the realm of conventionally standard poetry insofar as theme? No, not it. No, it was not. Um, what it what it really was was a bunch of humor essays, um, uh, McSweeney's pieces, um, parody news articles in the vein of the New Yorker's Andy Berowitz, um, or Reductress, or The Onion. But I figured, why not? I mean, I was sort of buoyed on by Claudia Rankine's book, which was amazing, by the way, and even though hers, of course, was not humor, most definitely was not humor. And I just took the idea of the form um, and, and created my own collection that way. Um, I, did ever, I never really got any, um, anyone interested in, in that book as a book of poetry. Um, and it didn't win any of the contests that I sent it to. Uh, not that I was surprised, but I changed my strategy and I sent it to the University of Nebraska Press um, as a book of essays, a mix of personal and reflective along with satire and humor pieces. Um, and it also contained a lot of Trump news parodies. And the editor at Nebraska said that he had been waiting for exactly that kind of book. Um, so it fit into the Press's Indigenous Studies series, um, Bison Books, instead of poetry. And I think that that is a funny evolution for the book. Um, but maybe it's not so unusual. I don't know. Um, the piece follows a chapter break titled Microaggression Memoirs, which I'll explain later that my chapter breaks um, I'll go into later. But I'm just going to go ahead and read the first world story problems, um, Brown Girl Multiple Choice Edition for you, um, just to, as, a, as a way to illustrate that. One, if a person on Facebook posts, and actually let me just preface this by letting you know that this is set up in, um, it looks like it is a test or a multiple choice edition um, test, and that's the, um, the form of it which is playing around, of course, with the idea of form and fragmentation and hybridity. Um, first world story problems, Brown Girl Multiple Choice Edition, number one. If a person on Facebook posts an illustration of a slave ship's cargo hold filled with hundreds of African people in an attempt to convey how horrifying modern day airline travel has become, especially transatlantic flights to Paris, how many minutes should you wait letting that sink in before you call bull? A, no minutes. You should respond and immediately. It is your duty to educate white folks everywhere. How else will they learn to be culturally sensitive allies? Or B, no minutes. Just shake it off and keep scrolling. C, eat a cupcake. You'll feel better. Number two. Sally works as a cashier at a drugstore. One day, her supervisor, Barb, gestures towards a native woman who is browsing 10 feet away. When Sally's supervisor mutters, gotta watch those people like a hawk, should Sally ignore his supervisor? It's just a misunderstanding. B, inform her supervisor that the native woman she's referring to just so happens to be Sally's mother who is visiting her at work 
and waiting for her to go on break. Or C, internalize the interaction, add it to a hundred and a thousand other similar incidents since childhood, and slowly accrete it over time, suspend Sally's faith and trust in her fellow humans while increasing her sense of self condemnation. It is reasonable for Sally to hold endless arguments with herself about how she's overreacting, being overly sensitive, playing the race card, how no one actually means her any harm, not really, and how should she how she should feel grateful, making mental note after mental note that no one likes a complainer, that no one will like her if she complains about situations and incidents which condemn others and might paint them in unflattering ways, and or worse, as bigots or racists. Is she a professional victim? Who does she think she is anyway? Rosa Parks? D, calm down. <laughs> Three, at another chain store, Sally once worked for, the manager called her into the front office for a little powwow, where she proceeded to A, congratulate her, B, offer her a raise, C, fire her. If you answered C, fire her, could this be considered a microaggression if the manager wasn't aware that Sally was native? Because Sally didn't wear braids or wear a headdress or other feather fringe accessories because Sally didn't have a medicine bag or carry a bow and arrow and she didn't paddle a birch bark canoe to work or ride, in a, ride on a spotted pony, but mostly it just kind of blended in with regular society. So how would the manager know? She didn't. Four, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet who wrote books about slavery, the antebellum era, and civil rights visited the very homogenous graduate writing program. One evening after a reading, the graduate students took the poet to a bar, to a bar outside of town for karaoke. Was the bar called A, Rudy's, B, the Slurpin' Burp? See the plantation. <laughs> Five, the preeminent writers conference accepts the following panel that seems to be based upon a kind of fatally false but persistently constructed fabricated colonialist shrink wrapped new agey lean and tree faint to see Indian paint by number chicanery set which the white supremacist narrative insists on doling out and swimming down ad nauseum. Did the panel description include A, fairies, B, pirates, C, rainbows, D, unicorns, C, Keebler elves, or F? Four Eastern Woodlands indigenous writers read poetry and prose anthologies evoking the 19th century ghost dance native people once did to make a stand for their lives and defy vanishing forever. These 21st century word warriors read, read work that embodies how the ghost dance prevails in their poems and stories that shine on in affirmation of Mother Earth, the spirits, and the ancient beauty ways. Number six, the Academy Awards have earned a faithful hashtag following, hashtag Oscars so white. So when in 2017, the wrong film was presented for the Oscar for Best Picture and correctly presented to La La Land instead of Moonlight, in my, own man, in my own mind, it was not unprecedented and seemed to represent something sinister. Why would I have any reason to be mistrustful of an heir? Because A, when author Daniel Handler presented African-American author Jacqueline Woodson a National Book Award for her poetic memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, he joked about her being allergic to watermelon. B, when Sean Penn presented Alondro um, Gonzalez Inirato's Oscar for Birdman, saying, who gave the son um, say, who gave the son of a bitch his green card? C, when Supreme Court Justice John Roberts reworded the oath swearing in President Obama so that it was necessary to swear him in again, all the news headlines stated that Obama had flubbed up his lines when it was Justice Roberts who was an heir. C, 
the award went to La La Land's producer for being so gracious and Moonlight was robbed of its moment. Number seven. For many indigenous people, the holidays and observance days are psychic landmines and, constant, and a constant reminder that native people are a colonized people whose own rich and complex history and culture means very little, if anything, within the broader society. Which holidays are potentially offensive to indigenous people? A, Halloween, B, Thanksgiving, C, Columbus Day, D, Independence Day, E, all of the above, F, 365 days of the year. <laughs> Number eight, how many white supremacists does it take to change a light bulb? A, the white supremacist has to want to change, B, society has to change, or C, first you need a ladder. <laughs> Um, just to continue on with, um, my time thing disappeared. Just to continue on with um, Paula's um, description um, for theme today on form and fluidity, uh, she writes in the uh, essay, this fragmentation, distortion, parody, and deconstruction of traditional forms implies that literature is a renewable resource, one that will always grow and change to reflect the cultural moment in which it is created. Hmm, that's weird. Um, so, yeah. I was interviewed about a piece that I published in the Massachusetts Review that may or may not be an essay or a poem. I was asked whether that piece, which was called Sheltering, is an essay with scare quotes and why I considered it an essay instead of a poem or another form. I answered that I considered it to be a hybrid piece or a creative nonfiction piece. I took a class during grad school that used John Degada's book as a text, an anthology of various writers' works called The Next American Essay, that is touted as each essay is a world of its own, a world so distinctive it, re it resists definition. And I have an appreciation for things that defy convention or resist definitions. Um, so naturally this would appeal to me. In the Massachusetts Review interview, I went on to say that however one prefers to view form or genre is all right by me when it comes to my own work. I am interested in hybrid creative nonfiction because it doesn't follow rules or strict structures or labels. Its guidelines resemble everything that I admire and appreciate in poetry, economy, lyricism, coyness, a sense of profundity without being outwardly uh, profound, uh, which is tricky. And of course, literariness. <laughs> I made that up. I love writing that allows for the subtlety of suggestion to drive its thesis. And of course, I love that about poetry also. I enjoy expanding the definition of nonfiction or the traditional essay form, and I certainly enjoy experimenting with structure. There are many different ways to convey narrative and to tell a story, but one of the fundamental principles of essay writing and nonfiction is that it must be 99% true. That's kind of my own idea. I don't know what others think on that. Maybe I can change the color of the shirt because light blue rather than red better captures a sense of the sea or the sky. If I happen to be writing about a seascape or the other way around, changing a blue shirt to a red shirt to convey being out of place or standing out. That's a mild example of staying from the truth, of straying from the truth for the sake of story. And of course, there are more dramatic examples. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share with you that piece um, that I was referring to, Sheltering, uh, which may or may not be um, a prose piece or an essay or a poem. Um, <laughs> 
Um, it's called sheltering. A, you are chopping onions for yet another pot of lentils, hips pressed up against the kitchen counter. When first you hear it, the sound of mewling, barely audible, you put down your knife. B, one year earlier on fellowship in Kansas, you are returning to your Airbnb from your walk. You see your house and yard down the street within view, but something looks peculiar. As you come closer, you make it out. It's a vulture feeding on a possum's corpse. C, plague doctors of the 17th century Europe wore black masks that resembled the beaks of birds. A, it sounds like a kitten in distress. So you turn to open the front door, to step barefoot up a slab of concrete stairs and scan the yard, the street, the park across the way. The mewling again, you tip your head back and see it. D, researchers proposed bats as the most likely reservoir for SARS-CoV-2. However, there are no documented cases of direct bat to human transmission. E, in the months before your mother's death, an owl visited her back patio for several days in a row. There are many ways to interpret this. B, the dead possum in your yard just steps away from your bedroom window. How long has the possum been there? As you move closer, the vulture is spooked and flies away. C, the half foot long beak of those sinister looking masks were filled with perfumes and herbs. It was commonly thought that the perfumes and fragrant herbs, herbs protected the wearer from diseases. The medicine of the time believed that the black plague was contracted through poisoned air. The perfumes were thought to fumigate the air. D. This suggests that an intermediate host between bats and humans was involved. The research also suggests that SARS-CoV-2 is similar to strains of bird flu. A. A blackbird in the top branches of the tree in your yard. It is making a fuss about what you can't begin to know, except that the similarity between Corvid, a class of birds, among them crows and ravens, and COVID isn't lost on you. C, or no E. Today, Wabisha gave Rice, the author, posted that the crow is black and can only say ka which is the Ojibwe word for no. B, the day before the dead possum and vulture, um, you visited uh, KU's butterfly sanctuary. Monarchs migrate to warmer climes, just like birds. They can travel from 50 to 100 miles a day. You observe newly born butterflies in a wall-to-wall -wall cage. Their collective sound, wings flapping, a rushing pulse of air. Flapping. <laughs> um, I have used form prior in many of my poems. As, um, I've used the form, the A, B, C, D, um, as in many of my uh, prior poems, as well as essays. Um, although I have not used letters to label or keep track of the different threads before, um, and my intentions for sheltering had much to do aesthetically the way that it looks on the page, as I as it did with theme or content, and of course that can be a kind of a chore for a page designer. My intentions for sheltering also depended upon necessity. I didn't have a prolonged or extended train of thought written out, just several impressions and snapshots, which is true of so much of what I write. And that is probably the poet in me and the reasoning behind my using fragmented narratives. Um, if this piece had been workshopped, the feedback would have been to make connections between the disparate impressions. And I wouldn't contest that feedback. 
because even though the reader can suss out the essay's meaning, very often readers are invested in being privy to the author's meaning, to the author's interiority and connections. Otherwise, we don't feel satisfied that a piece of writing is finished. And it's funny that we want art tied up with a bow, because if art isn't reflective of life or reality, then why shouldn't art be just as random and chaotic as life? I guess that's my defense for fragmented narratives without the connective exposition. Um, I was going to talk a little bit more about fragmentation. Wait, yeah, and fluidity um, as far as how it relates to my chapter titles for Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese's, but uh, we're coming in on time. And I, I thought, is that, yeah, I think it's been a half an hour. Tiffany, I think we do still have some time if you'd like. Uh, we could probably go for another maybe five minutes if you'd like. Oh, Is that sure. enough time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Goes by so quickly. Um, so, yes, let's see here. Um, so, I have these chapter titles. And I think that relates to, you know, fragmentation and sort of the idea of hybridity, because um, in the book, Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese's, I had, I had made rather elaborate chapter titles, and they were, they were like written down the page as if they were a poem, but it had never, I just was looking at them in, in so far as form, because it had never occurred to me that they were poems until other people pointed that out to me, which is, you know, kind of stupid on my part. I mean, that I didn't even, um, you know, in, intend them to be looked at as poems. I was just interested in how they looked on the page. Um, and uh, yeah. But I see now that they are actually very short and um, humorous poems. And, it's, and I like that they're just one line um, because why shouldn't they just be one line? Why can't we just have like one line poems? Um, and that relates also to technology um, and some of what um, Paula was talking about um, in her theme description was this idea of postmodernism or post postmodernism. <laughs> as being, uh, uh, you know, forms of technology and how uh, art and literature is sort of evolved into um, all of this types of, you know, technology, which would be, um, and I've talked about this quite a lot in the past, which would be things like Twitters um, or tweets, because um, I use Twitter quite a bit and it's um, very oftentimes, I think of them as poems um, or just, you know, because they're jokes and, jokes and, and poems and um, punchlines are very relatable. I mean, they're very interchangeable. And they use all of these very similar elements, um, which is part of, partly why I'm a humorist too, but the, my writing humor and my writing jokes and my writing poems, they just inform one another. Um, and to me, they're interchangeable, um, particularly in the early days of Twitter, when you only had 40 characters to work with. And, you know, poetry has sets of rules and it has rhythm and it has beats and meter. And those are all incredibly similar to um, 40 characters and writing a joke um, or a punchline or something like that. Um, so that sort of relates um, into the theme of form and fluidity as well. Um, you know, calling a chapter title for a collection of humorous essays, poems. Um, so the first one um, from my book was uh, the first chapter was my origin story is a cross between call me Ishmael, a few too many whiskey sours packed in an old thermos at the drive-in double feature and that little voice that says, you got this. And then I had part two was instead of raised by wolves t-shirt, mine says raised by functional alcoholics with intimacy phobias and low self-esteem. Part three, Garsh Dernit, you say patriarchy, I say patrimalarchy, dollars to donuts, cuckoo banana pants, you gals and your lady power this and that. Um, so those are just sort of examples 
of my chapter titles and I love books and chapter titles. I love naming things and, and I particularly enjoy extremely long chapter titles um, and or, or titles of poems that you know are like three li lines long. I just think that's wonderful um, and I'm all for it. I'm all down for it 100%. And that's my spiel on chapter titles and fragmented narratives um, in, in this uh, talk about form and fluidity. So that's all for today, folks. <laughs> Well, that was wonderful, Tiffany. Thank you so much. Um, it just, it's really great to, you know, when we develop these themes for uh, the Let's Talk About It program, it's often sort of um, developed by a committee of people. And then we send it out to our scholars to sort of, like we give them the, the title of the theme and sort of the broad strokes of what we want it to accomplish. And then we send it out to wonderful people like Paula um, who really develop it. and you know, just to hear how how that theme is interpreted by the author whose book is included in that theme is just very insightful and um, really just wonderful. So um, mm -hmm. I am going to uh, encourage people, just a quick reminder, um, if you have questions for the author, uh, if you look down uh, at the author, for Tiffany, <laughs> um, if you look down below uh, the the video screen, you'll see some buttons. Uh, one of them says Q&A. If you can submit your written question through the Q&A feature, we have a way of keeping track of those and that way we make sure we don't miss anyone. Um, I know from experience at last time, uh, it can take folks a few minutes to kind of think of their questions and to get their typing fingers all warmed up. So I do have a couple questions of my own that we can start with while folks are kind of coming up with what they would like to ask you. Um, and I always feel bad too, um, because I think Tiffany, you weren't able to see our faces, um, but I can assure you, at least my face was laughing uh, for a good portion of your presentation and uh, was just very enjoyable. So thank you for that. Um, my first question, and I think this one kind of uh, uh, segments well into sort of your closing, uh, the closing portion of your presentation. When you're talking about titles, one of my questions was actually, if you could explain to us where you came up with the title, bury my heart at Chuck E. Cheese's and, and what that means uh, for you. Yeah, it's very convoluted. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that went into that. Um, I was thinking, you know, bury my heart at the Cracker Barrel or I bury my heart at Walmart or I bury my heart at the Cheesecake Factory. I mean, I just liked the word cheese. Um, <laughs> Paula wrote a, a book about commodity cheese at one point. I don't know. They're just, I love the idea of cheese. Um, but uh, the um, Chuck E. Cheese just seemed like a natural progression for me. And it had a lot to do with this notion of the commodification of the sacred. And I know that that sounds, you know, a little bit contrary to, <laughs> um, you know, no one wants to poke fun at the sacred. That's not was my intention. That wasn't what I was intending, but it was more so in line with, um, you know, pointing out how um, a lot of our sacred traditions and Lakota uh, and other indigenous nations um, traditions have been commodified. Um, and, and distorted. Um, and so that was like one aspect of it, you know, the idea of dream catchers and, you know, like a lean and tree, you know, merchandise that you see at the gas station and wolf t-shirts. I mean, just all of this stuff, you know, that's not native, native American at all. It's just sort of a bastardization of all of those things. So that was part of it. And the other thing was that there's an extremely famous um, best-selling book that came out in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, called Burying My Heart at Wounded Knee. And that was sort of the definitive text um, that uh, people and public um, and society were coming to awareness of all of the atrocity um, surrounding you know, the Native American um, uh, genocide. Um, and it was a really incredibly, it was still like a bestseller. It's still like number one bestseller. Um, the 
and I, I, you know, at the time, I mean, it brought people to an awareness and, and an understanding, um, which was all good things. Um, but, you know, 50 years later, to still be referring to that particular text is just was outdated. And it, the, there was also this sort of sinister um, tone to that book in that it was painting um, indigenous people as, um, as um, already gone and lost and forgotten as fatalistic. And I just needed to sort of push against this notion of, you know, of erasure um, as native people as tra trauma um, as fatal. And I, I just needed to push against that. Um, and so that's why I also was playing and toying with that title. Also, the author of that book, um, D. Brown, we was not a native person. That was like a non-native, that was a white person uh, that wrote that book. Um, and so that was another thing that I wanted to push back against because native people are, you know, we're capable of telling our own stories um, and we should be telling our own stories. And so I always promote that aspect. Um, and bury my heart at Wounded Knee, a lot of people believe that is a line from a famous Indian chief, probably, you know, someone like Joseph um, from the Nez Perce or Sitting Bull or, um, and it's not, it doesn't, um, it, it actually isn't subscribed to any uh, Native American person. That line, bury my heart at Wounded Knee was a poem from an early 20th century poet, a white man, um, whose name escapes me at the moment. But so I, I just needed to push back against that. And um, sometimes when people are in the know about that stuff, they think that I am making fun of genocide or you know what have you. And that's and there and it's it's not my intention at all it, whatsoever because all of those all of those things, the book the poem, the title, they had nothing to do with us. <laughs> we didn't invent any of that stuff. So I felt completely within, you know, I felt completely entitled um, to sort of twist that around um, and, you know, make it my own <laughs> in that way. That's, so that's a very long answer. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, what a, what a very robust, um, deep answer to what seems like a very simple question. I love it. That's great. Um, I've had a, a couple questions come in through the Q&A feature. Um, the first question I have is, do you write with a particular audience in mind? That's a really great question. And um, oftentimes people will ask that and um, the answer changes from time to time. Um, I write just for whoever is um, reading. Um, I write basically just for, I mean, myself. I have all the, I have intentions for like every different piece that I put out. Um, like, okay, here's an example. Um, I write um, a bi bi monthly column for the Moscow Daily News. And I, you know, I, I seem to kind of hold back a lot um, insofar as my own personal um, views and my own sense of tone, um, things like that. Um, it's an op-ed. I can, you know, I can write about whatever it is that I want, but because the audience is in this part of Idaho is, you know, very homogenized, um, I sort of have to cater my voice um, to that audience. Um, when I was writing op-eds for Indian Country Today, <laughs> I, I took a lot more liberties to use, you know, my own voice and my own ideas and my own opinions. I didn't, wasn't tailoring, um, tailoring my ideas or my writing for any particular audience. And that I was doing that mostly for me or for a Native American audience um, that would be getting a lot of what I was saying. Um, so it just depends on, on all of the different sorts of writing and pieces. Um, and my own personal stuff, um, I'm always going to be, the audience is always going to, first of all, be myself. But as you get deeper into it, there's um, a lot more different venues. Um, and I'm not making sense right now. I'm rambling, but. <laughs> That's okay. It's a Thursday afternoon. Yeah, that's where we're at. That's totally fine. And that makes perfect sense. You know, when you're um, 
to the very different audiences, especially when you're um, working more in a journalistic capacity. Whereas I feel like when you're writing a book, something where you're really writing it for yourself, it might be a very different process than when you're writing for a particular audience. Um, I have another item here. It looks This one looks more like a comment, but I'll go ahead and read it out anyway. Um, it says that we are so glad to see Tiffany associated with High Country News. This is a perfect fit, and we look forward to each issue and see what you find pe peculiar in the West. So that's a nice. I am also a subscriber to High Country News. Um, it's a great, great publication. And we do have another question here. Um, uh, somebody would like to know, are you working on another book right now? Yeah, um, I have a couple of things going on right now. Um, I'm working on a young adult um, fiction book um, that's a little bit of an adventure <laughs> and um, a little bit of a speculative um, uh, things that are happening and, you know, about a Lakota girl, um, an urban Indian um, who lost her mother at a very young age. And um, I'm also working on another, you know, a, a collection of, of humor, much like uh, Bury My Heart at um, Chuck E. Cheese's because it needs a companion, I think. <laughs> and because I just have so much fun, um, you know, with um, promoting um, Chuck E. Cheese. And, um, you know, and I was really fortunate to be able to um, do some readings and some touring a little bit um, with Chuck E. Cheese before uh, COVID hit. So I'm really glad that I got to travel around and go to different places um, with that. And I'm hoping that if I have another humor book and this and this other young adult book that I'll be able to make some in-person um, promotional appearances um, like I did with the last one because it was just really a lot of fun. Yeah. That's great. Um, I saw just another uh, comments that came through that somebody else just seconded the, the high country news uh, first thing they read, which is great. Um, I do have a couple questions. Uh, we don't have any specific questions. So I have um, a couple that, you know, this is just me asking as a member of the audience. Um, forgive me in advance. The question is very long winded. So if you need me to repeat any part of it, I will. <laughs> Um, but so with regard to bury my heart at Chuck E. Cheese's, and I'm reading from my sheet because um, that's how I operate. There's some chapters in this book where I just, I can't even begin to describe them because when I try, there's like this crazy logic that sort of unravels, almost like a description just can't hold what it is I'm talking about. So for example, um, you have an entire chapter that's presented as the written transcript of a competition between online videos of racist tirades, which is judged by a mixture of real life political pundits and fictional TV characters. And of course, it all takes place in the JCPenney. <laughs> you have another one of your uh, chapters it serves as this like amazing, crazy takedown of disingenuous body positivity through a love letter to full figured women from none other than Buffalo Bill of Silence of the Lambs fame. So in other words, uh, the premises of some of your pieces are just kind of downright bonkers in like the best possible way. So <laughs> my question for you is, because I'm so curious, how do you come up with your ideas? And how do you know the difference between something really absurd that will just hit the mark and something that might fly over people's heads? And like how, from a writing perspective, how do you kind of manage all of that? That's, yeah. Um... I just go with my gut, I guess. <laughs> um, I grew up in a really interesting household. My father was um, a devoted, absolutely devoted to um, Monty Python's Flying Circus, and so that was part of and part of my early training um, as you know, being able to identify you know the sweet spot, I guess. <laughs> Um, and, of, and of course, humor is just absolutely so subjective, you know, it's going to go over a lot of people's heads. Um, but with my humor, I use a lot of um, things within the news. Um, so I would hope that people are news savvy and they like look at the news, they look at their timelines and they see all of the stuff that people are talking about um, within like the news cycle. And I also use a lot of popular, um, popular culture. Um, some people don't pay attention to any of that stuff. And so if they don't pay attention to that stuff, they're probably not going to really get a lot of what I write. 
um, because those are the things that I'm mostly concerned about. But fortunately, a lot of people are very interested in all that stuff. Um, you know, I have other, I know a lot of other humor writers um, that, that's all within our purview. That's all the stuff that we're, we're responding to. Um, and sociologically, um, people, I, I mean, within, yeah, there's, so, there's writers that write a lot of sociological commentary, um, not necessarily humorists, but people that comment on what's happening in the world with, you know, there's a lot of writers like that, that I really like and enjoy. Um, my mom grew up um, on the reservation in Eastern Montana. And so they, she and they <laughs> have a very particular kind of humor, uh, which is, which is really um, silly and absurd. Um, and also a bit dark, um, a little morbid at times, um, just, you know, kind of raunchy. Um, and I, I incorporate that and I grew up with that. I grew up with my mom, you know, being completely irrelevant um, and just, you know, going for the jugular uh, with certain kinds of humor, which, you know, like I said, it's all subjective, but um, I just grew up in a very, you know, sort of, I had like the perfect combination, I think, <laughs> between my mom and my dad, you know, he appreciated her humor and she appreciated his and uh, <laughs> maybe that's all it takes. <laughs> I think there's something to that, definitely. Uh, the, the foundation of a strong relationship is humor, I guess, right? <laughs> well, and speaking of humor, I wonder, we, I'm keeping an eye, I don't see any more uh, questions from the audience, so I will continue to hog the time for my own personal gain. But, you know, I couldn't help but think, you know, in reading through Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese's that you have, you're covering a lot of really dark stuff. You know, there's everything from big, like, large scale tragedies like genocide and war to you know more of the small personal tragedies like the death of a family member or or body shaming and yet you do it all with like this really wry humor and and often very dark humor and i'm i'm wondering if you can just touch maybe just in the next two or three minutes if you can kind of wrap up talking about like what humor is like how do you use humor to deal with trauma whether that's collective trauma or individual trauma and why that why are people often so drawn to humor as a way of dealing with that <laughs> yeah I would suppose that there's a lot of reasons why people are drawn to that um and I think just um you know it's a coping strategy for one thing um, and it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of native, um, writers, a lot of native humor writers will just, will say, um, that it's built into our culture to, as a way to, you know, um, heal, um, from trauma, um, cope with trauma. Um, and I don't know how that would, um, go over in this, um, psychology community, um, because a lot of people might look at that as, um, disassociate. <laughs> disorder um to you know just laugh in the face of you know darkness or laugh in the face of tragedy um and you know I don't want to excuse myself for that and I don't want to minimize um tragedy or trauma in any way shape or form and I think that people already realize that and know that um comedy is about truth telling um, for instance, uh, you know, we look to late night television hosts, um, late night television shows um, for our truth tellers. <laughs> and it seems like we look for um, people that we would assume are telling the truth. They're often telling us lies. Um, you know, our political leaders, you know, they're not telling us the truth. Um, so that is a really important um, part of um, humor as well. Um, it's, you know, it's biting and it does, it tells the truth. Um, so we can depend on it for that. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, Native Americans as being resilient. And I mean, such is true, um, but that's not all that we are, of course. Um, and, you know, humor and comedy is um, a part of that a part of, you know, our resiliency, of course. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's true of um, a lot of sort of trauma informed, you know, cultures, um, you know, like the Jewish people, um, <laughs> we're, you know, 
thousands of years of repression. Um, and then we've created these comedic, you know, um, titans um, in the Jewish uh, community and, um, you know, com comedies and actors and directors that, you know, I've admired, you know, my whole entire life. Um, and there's a lot to be said for, you know, cultures that have, you know, undergone um, extreme um, trauma and oppression over the years as being able to, um, you know, as, as I don't know, I don't know what exactly that, what, how that, um, how that comes about um, yeah. Yeah. through that kind of, yeah, but it's just, it's something that I always um, think about and, you know, and uh, try to find comment on. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot to like suddenly, no. you know, change from being a, a humor writer to a psychologist, but it's, it's always interesting to get people's perspective on that. So I think that's all we have um, for now. I'm going to just for folks who are um, in our audience, hang tight. I'm going to give um, some closing remarks and information about who our next speaker in the series is. Um, Tiffany, thank you so much for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, I encourage anybody who hasn't read her book yet to go ahead and do so. Uh, I promise you will be laughing out loud. Um, so I thanks again, Tiffany. I'm going to go ahead and share um, the uh, slide here for um, for next our next month's session. Um, so uh, that will be on Thursday, June 23rd with Reina Grande, and Ms. Grande is the author of the memoir, The Distance Between Us, which is a new title featured in our biography and autobiography theme. Registration is required, so please visit the Let's Talk About It website to get signed up for that. And finally, again, before you leave, please take a few quick minutes to complete our session feedback form or at least grab the link to that. That link will also be sent out to everyone who registered along with access to uh, the recording of this event. And your feedback is an incredibly valuable tool to help us uh, improve our programs in the future. So thank you everyone for being with us today and we will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>